Algorithms. What are they and why do we want to analyze them? That's what this lecture is about. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step problem solving method. So for example, we have a computational problem such as sorting a database, finding the closest pair of points among some large number of points in the plane, something like that. And we need to give a step-by-step -step way of solving that which is valid for any input. Always gives the right answer. In some sense, if you have a very, very detailed cake recipe, that is an algorithm. Getting back to more mathematical kind of problem, Euclid over 2,000 years ago gave an algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two positive integers. And this is a much better algorithm than the usual primary school method that involves factorizing numbers into primes. So you can see from this long history that algorithms were not invented by Al Gore and neither are they named after him. In fact, the name is a Latin version of an Arabic name of a Middle Eastern mathematician who lived around a thousand years ago who showed Europeans how to add and multiply numbers written in decimal notation. Remember that they were still using Roman numerals until quite late. So this new idea of representing things with place value with a zero required some new techniques if you wanted to be able to do calculations with these numbers. How they actually did calculations with Roman numerals, I have no idea. Now we have to distinguish between an algorithm and a program. An algorithm is a high-level concept. It's a mathematical abstraction in some sense, whereas a program is a sequence of computer instructions in a given language. If you have an algorithm which is designed to solve a particular problem and you want to solve it on reasonable size inputs, you're going to need to implement it via a computer program. A program can in fact have several different algorithms implemented in it. Algorithms can be described in ordinary language, but usually we use some kind of pseudocode, which is like a fake computer language similar to many computer languages that you may have already seen or will see in the future. Of course, if you write a program, it has to be in a specific language with very strict rules on syntax. So that's the main difference. Algorithms are high-level, step-by-step problem-solving methods, whereas programs are what you use in order to apply algorithms to solve real-world problems using computers. And just to reiterate, the step-by-step -step nature of an algorithm is extremely important. It has to be specified in such detail that everything can be delegated to a machine with no imagination. One historical note is that before electronic computers were developed in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the term computer meant a human whose job was to assist someone with computation. In fact, most early computers were women. This, of course, is a job which is very important, but also rather tedious, because in the end it involved applying various algorithms to crunch numbers in most cases. So why do we want to analyze algorithms? Well, there are several main reasons. First, it's very important that your algorithm is actually correct. If it's not solving the problem that it's purportedly solving, then there's very little point in implementing it. That seems quite obvious. In these lectures, we're mostly going to concentrate on efficiency of algorithms. We're going to ignore the questions of correctness most of the time because we will see that most of our algorithms are reasonably obviously correct. However, it's very important that before you implement any complicated algorithm, you first sit down and prove or convince yourself very seriously that it is in fact correct. In other words, it's actually solving the original problem. And it's amazing how much time is wasted in programming by people prematurely starting to write code when they're not even sure what their program is supposed to do because they haven't seriously thought about the algorithm in enough detail. So now moving on to efficiency, let's think about the advances in computing over the last 70 years. There have been enormous increases in performance. 
we can solve much bigger problems much faster than we could at the beginning. And some of that is because of advances in hardware, faster chips, better design of machines. Some of it is because of better human programmers, better programming languages, these kinds of implementation specific ideas. However, interestingly, about half of the speed up is attributable to better algorithms. In other words, just better ways, more efficient ways of solving problems. So using sophisticated industrial strength algorithms rather than naive ones, maybe the first thing you would have thought of, has a big payoff. Now, as well as just getting rid of obviously inefficient algorithms and looking at better ones, there's a whole other aspect to algorithm analysis, namely optimizing parameters. There are many algorithms which have various parameters associated with them. The value of the parameter doesn't affect the correctness of the algorithm, but it does affect the speed or the running time. And in a particular application, we might want to set this parameter optimally. Now, how are we going to set this optimally? It can't be done in a purely empirical way. Right? There are too many possible inputs to consider, usually, to run on every one of them. We need to actually have a model to understand the running time, how it varies with the parameter. So an example would be, suppose you have a recursive algorithm, maybe for sorting, which takes a whole lot of recursive calls. When it gets near the bottom, typically it's making a large number of calls of a very small size lists, let's say, which is trying to sort. There may come a time where the overhead of spawning all these recursive calls is not really worth it. We're getting down to small lists of size 10. Maybe we could just use a simpler direct algorithm to do those ones and stop the recursion. Now, in principle, this makes sense, but how are we going to decide where to cut off? You can't do that without some kind of formal algorithm analysis if you want to be effective. So an example of this might be a recursive sorting algorithm like quicksort. It's very common that the recursion is bailed out of before you get to the bottom and something like insertion sort, a much simpler direct algorithm, is used. So I'm going to start with the first example. Let's define a sequence recursively. It's a very well-known sequence called the Fibonacci numbers. It's given by this recurrence as long as n is big enough and we have some initial conditions for when n isn't big enough we have to name the first two values and we specify them in this way so this is obviously a recursively defined function and just by mimicking the definition of the function we can write down an algorithm for computing the nth term and here's the algorithm, and I'm calling slow fib. Uh, the first few lines, lines 2, 3, and 4, just deal with uh, special cases, initial conditions, and what happens if we shove in a negative integer, which we could return an error, but we might as well just return 0. And otherwise, if you get to line 5, then we just call the function on itself, in the obvious way, mimicking the definition of the function. So it's obvious that this algorithm is correct because it's just copying the definition of the function. However, there's a big problem, as it turns out, with efficiency of this algorithm. So I'm going to claim that this algorithm is extremely inefficient. We'll start by looking at an example just to see the kind of thing that goes wrong. Suppose you want to calculate the value f of 4 using this definition. Well, you have to recursively compute f of 3 and f of 2. To compute f of 3, you then spawn some other recursive calls, f of 2 and f of 1. And here you have to do yet another recursive call, two of them in fact. And then here you have to do the same thing. Now, when we get to the bottom of this tree here, we don't have to do any more recursion because we're at the initial condition, so we just look up the value. However, all of these leaves in the tree 
are independent. We're making recursive calls. We first do this, then we do this, 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 go all the way back up. Then we calculate this part. And we don't actually save any of the information that we've gained. However, you can see here that f of 0 is calculated twice. But we only really needed to calculate it once if we were clever. Similarly here, f of 1 is done several times. Now, in fact, the whole algorithm just starts with some n, recursively goes all the way down to the bottom, and then it ends up with these numbers f of 1 and f of 0, which are 1 and 0, respectively, and it just adds them up. So the actual answer is going to be the number of uh, leaves at the bottom here which have an f of 1 in them. That's what it's going to turn out to be. The problem is there's an enormous number of those. So let's think about a different, more efficient way to solve the same problem. If I gave you this definition of Fibonacci numbers and you played with it for a while, you probably already have at some point in your mathematical study, you would probably try and work out what the first few values were equal to. And you can see it's very easy to calculate the first few values just by using the initial conditions and the recurrence repeatedly. I can go on forever here. So the simple idea of going from the bottom up instead of the top down is actually the basis of an important algorithm design technique called dynamic programming, which you may hear about in future. In this case, it turns out to work beautifully. An algorithm which mimics this procedure is much, much more efficient, as it turns out, than the original top-down one using the definition of the function. So here's what I'm calling the fast method, based on calculating bottom-up instead of top-down. So the first few lines, 2, 3, and 4, just deal with the simple cases that we talked before. And then the interesting part, instead of doing a recursive call, in lines 8 to 11, we actually do a loop. So we first set uh, A and B to the initial conditions. B is the f of 0, and A is f of 1. And then we loop through from 2 to n, and what do we do? Well, you see what we're doing there in line 10? We're letting the new A be the old A plus B. So the first time we go around, it'll be 1 plus 0. It'll give you 1. The new B is actually the old A, which was stored in the temp variable T, just so we didn't overwrite it in line 10. So in line 9, we saved it, and then we use it again in line 11. But in any case, we're just doing three assignment statements in that loop. That left uh, arrow, left pointing arrow, is simply an assignment in the pseudocode I'm using here. As I said, it's no particular language, but it looks very similar to many languages. Now, it's actually not hard to see that this is correct. Coming back to the examples we have here, here are the initial values of B and A. After the first iteration, they're like that. The next iteration, they have those values. Next iteration, that one, etc. When you come to the end, when uh, the loop finishes, the value of A is, in fact, the Fibonacci number that you want. Now looking again at the pseudocode for the algorithm, we see that inside that loop, we're going around n minus 1 times. And each time we're doing three assignment statements and an addition and a few, doing some fixed amount of work. And before we get into that loop, we're just doing some fixed amount of work that doesn't depend on n. It has to be done no matter what the value of n is. So actually, we are doing about some constant times n plus some other constant amount of work. Okay. And we call that a linear time algorithm. The other algorithm, the slow algorithm, is very much worse than that. And that's something that we're going to think about later. So this is a short introductory lecture, and we're coming to the end of it. But now we have a very important part, which are the questions for you to take away and think about. First one is crucial. It's very important that you do this. Implement 
both of these, the fast and the slow algorithm for Fibonacci numbers in your favorite language. Check, starting with small values of n, which one is faster. You're going to see fairly quickly that n doesn't have to be very big before what we're calling slow fib turns out to be very, very slow. In fact, it takes so long that you'll get bored and turn it off. But try and work out which values of n it's competitive and where does the what we're calling the fast algorithm overtake it. So that's an important thing that you should do. The next one is to think about the slow algorithm. Remember the tree that I drew? Think about that for a general value of n. Try and work out how much work is going to be done by the algorithm. In the end, it's just doing a whole lot of function calls until it gets right to the bottom. And then it has these values 0 and 1, and it adds them all up repeatedly, actually. But how many of them are there? Right, you might want to think about that. Turns out it's a pretty big number. So think hard about these problems, do the implementation, and I'll see you at the next lecture, if not before.